Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Uh, I'd like to start this program with the recitation of the Holy Quran. So may I invite, I would please to invite Brother Mohsen Adak to recite the Holy Quran to start off the program. Bar Muhammad wa Muhammad Salabat. Allah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal adiyati zabha. Fal muriyati qadha. Fal mughirati subha. Fa atharna bihi naqa'a. Fawasatna bihi jam'a. Inna al-insana li rabbihi lakanun. وَإِنَّهُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ لَشَهِيدٌ وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٌ أَفَلَا يَعْلَمُ إِذَا بُعْثِرَ مَا فِي الْقُبُورِ وَحُصِّلَ مَا فِي الصُّدُورِ إِنَّ رَبَّهُمْ بِهِمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ لَخَبِيرٌ صدق الله العلي العظيم سلوات الله محمد وعجل فرجهم Thank you brother Mohsen Adak for such a beautiful recitation of the Holy Quran uh, I would like to welcome every Mumini Muminat that are listening to today's program uh, This is the fourth lecture in the series of weekly lectures with Hujjat al-Islam Mawana Haider Shirazi, on the famous book by Imam Khomeini, Adab al-Salaf, The Discipline of Prayers. Before I invite Mawana, I would like to make a couple of announcements. Tomorrow, January 30th, Saturday night, we will be having a majlis Ada for the Salah Sabab of late Dr. Rehan Azmi, virtually online. Um, the program will start at 7.30 p.m. with the recitation of the Holy Quran. At 7.35, we'll be having Salam in Marcia. And at 8 p.m. sharp, we will have a speech by Mulana Kamar Ali Leilani in Urdu, and he is blessing us from Pakistan. All Mumini and Muminat are requested to attend the program tomorrow. Um, also, after this program, we'll be having a short Q&A for those who are listening. So if you would like to ask any question to Mulana, Please drop the question and type out the question in the comment section on the YouTube link. Um, and to find this video is go on to Moment Center and it'll be transmission live. You'll be able to see the video. Um, in that link, just drop it in the comment section below your questions and we will use your questions for the Q&A. Um, the Q&A will be about 10 to 15 minutes. Or, and if you do not have a computer, then you could also text me as well. The number is 214-600-6953 in order to ask the questions for Q&A. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Mulana Heather Shirazi, our blessed scholar and our beloved scholar for another beautiful lecture. Bar Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Salwat. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي المقاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل على أهل بيته الأطيبين الأنجبين بهم نتولى ومن أعدائهم نتبرأ إلى الله اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توها وتمتعه فيها طويلا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وأجل فرجه we ask Allah wa ta'ala to make this majlis a majlis of learning, a majlis of ma'rifa, so that we decrease the distance between us and our Lord, inshallah. 
Salat, it's that beautiful gem that Allah Taala has given to the creation. And that's the fastest track to get to Allah Jalla wa ala. Now all these sessions that we've been having, the talk that has been mentioned, now the disclaimer would be that it is not an economy class or a budget or a cheap class worship that we have. And we are all working on elite class or the high end worship to make this Salat to that highest of the qualities that has been mentioned. And it's a difficult task, not impossible, because all these prescriptions have been given for the mankind, for the Bashar, for the human beings, and whosoever has arrived at whatever rank it is because of this Salat and giving importance to this Salat. So Adab Salat, it's the discipline of the prayers. And tonight we'll talk a little bit about the attire, the clothing, the dress code, and also a little bit about the ruku that we perform in our prayers. So clothing, libas, the cover, the attire that we have, it has three dimensions and somewhat all three should be covered. The first, it's this human body that Allah has given to us, which is the material body. It's discipline and it's... Uh, and then uh, the senses that he has given to us, the hearing, the seeing, the touch, the taste, etc. So the first level of that cover is the clothing that I wear. And at the same time, all these inputs to the soul that we have be covered, be secured, so that my sight, it is focused to the existence of God. My hearing, it is focused to him. I don't listen to something else. Do I, nor do I see something else, nor my taste buds are active to something else. So everything is connected and covered by Allah. Now in one of the uh, sayings that we have from the, from the wise, the noble insights, they say that if, well, what do we do to better focus in our prayers? The reply given is that you secure the inputs to your soul, the seven inputs that you have. Because the gates that are there for the hell, they are seven. And there are seven inputs to the soul as well. So if we secure these seven inputs to the soul, whilst we are in worship, then those seven gates and doors to the hell, they will be secured and closed upon us. So what are those seven inputs to the soul? It's the two eyes, the two ears, the mouth, and then the two private parts. So if these seven are guarded outside prayers, then a better service will be performed. And whilst in prayers, a better service will be able to, be, uh, to conduct. So that is that first level, that first discipline, the senses, the cover of the material body be observed. Now this material body that I have, it is a cover to the barzakhi existence of mine. That is that spiritual and existence of mine or the inner senses. So the outer cover is covering the inner existence of mine. And the third level, it is related to ghaib and beyond. And that is related to the heart. So if you see how beautiful the whole system is, it is in layers. So the material body covers my barzakhi body, which is the inner self. That covers the heart. So the outer one, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a cover to the inner one. The inner one, it's a further cover to the extreme end. So one of the traits which is in fact an attribute towards man's perfection, it is that rida, that contentment of Allah Taala. Now it may be a little bit intense, but it's good to know some of this stuff because whatever we hear, then some way, at some point in our life, uh, more windows will open up in our minds by these, uh, this information that is being provided. 
That is the rida, the contentment of the, uh, the Almighty Allah. That rida, it helps a lot in purifying the soul. It tunes the heart to attract the special divine favors. As a result, strengthens one's iman. Now the, the height or the ultimate nearness that can be sought as mentioned by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he says, مَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدٌ بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَضْتُ عَلَيْهِ Says if someone, a servant wants to get closer to me, to the Almighty God, says there's nothing that would bring him closer to me than that what I have obligated him. And what is that? Says he can get closer to me by these nawafil, by these mustahab prayers. So mustahab prayers, they bring us closer to Allah Jalla wa'ala. And then he says, فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ كُنْتُ سَمَعَهُ الَّذِي يَسْمَعُ بِهِ And if Allah starts liking someone, if Allah, he starts loving someone, says that his hearing will be the hearing of God when he hears. When he sees that sight of his, the eyes of his will be the eyes of God. So it's the eyes of God that see. It's the ears of God that are hearing. It's the tongue of God that is speaking. So this existence of man becomes the reflection of the existence of God. Or when it is said that Imam al-Asr alayhi salatu was salam he is that watchful eye of Allah. He is that hearing ear of Allah. It is for this reason, because he is an obedient servant of God. And anyone who is obedient to the Almighty, Allah bestows these qualities upon him. And that nearness and that quality of being a servant is sought by way of worship. And among them are these nawafil and these mustahab prayers that you offer. So on and off that what we learn from this beautiful riwayat is that we shouldn't stick to only the wajib, wajib prayers that Allah has obligated us for. In addition to that, mustahabbat must be done and a lot should be done so that a lot of benefit also can be attracted and achieved by the existence, from the existence of the Almighty God. Now then he says that as a result of these nawafil that he has sought closer and come closer to me, that hand of his will be the hand of God or the hand which is in the service of the Almighty Allah. And now he says, such a person who has come closer to me by way of nawafil and worship says in da'ani, if he calls me, if he supplicates to me, and then whatever he wants, I will give him as a result of that uh, nearness that he has sought towards me, and that is by worship. Again, dress code, the attire that we wear in, pra in prayers, the ruling that we have, if it's very grand, very expensive attire, that will make one feel proud, and the mutakabbir, his place is the fire. So we've come to seek the nearness of God with fancy dressing, with expensive clothing, clothing that cannot be sought. So we want to be near him and then we don't want to get away from him. So any expensive stuff or any fancy clothing and dressing that will drive us away from the Almighty Allah. Anyways, fancy clothing, it is haram. It shakes and it weakens the heart and, the, and it distances us and all those uh, beautiful uh, characters and akhlaq that we have. And it results in pride and kibr and riya and every one of them and showing off and every one of these uh, that was mentioned, kibr and riya and showing off and pride, each one of them, it's the source of every evil. And it is a source of attachment to this world and the charms and beauties of this dunya and the desires this dunya has, and that is the biggest mistake a person can make. And the hadith also says in Usul uh, al-Kafi, I believe it's the first hadith, it said, رأس كل خطيئتين حب الدنيا That is the source of every khata, the source of every uh, wrong, it is that attachment and the love towards this dunya. 
So as a result of that fancy dressing, why do we dress like that? It's because of that love we have to this dunya. So that is that first mistake. And that is Hubbud Dunya Rasukul Khati, I think that has been mentioned. And also Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, he says that the Almighty, he is in rage with one who dresses fancy. Or the term used in fiqh and the tawzil masail of the ulama, it's libasu shuhra. That is fancy dressing. Now that could be both good and bad. In either cases, the destination for both of them, it is the fire. Furthermore, the Almighty, he is in rage with these two shuhrats. Now, what are these two shuhrats? These two, um, says an attire that a person wears, a dress that a person wears, which is fancy, which is expensive to show off. That is one. And secondly, sometimes the prayers that people offer, those prayers, they are not, to, for, not for the existence of God. They are to show to other people that how pious of a person I am. So if that is the case, then th those prayers will be a means of rage of Allah. And if it is that dress code, that dress code also will be a means uh, to attract and get to the rage and wrath of Allah Jalla wa'ala. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam, he says that one who wears fancy clothes in this world, he will wear the dresses of disgrace in the Akhirah. So Salat, prayers, it means it's ascension. That is that mi'raj, ascension towards the nearness of Allah Taala to his acquaintance. And there are dangers amidst this path as well. Salik, as it was mentioned, that the person who is on this journey, on this track, and he is moving towards Allah in this, in this, on this path. So that is Salik. Suluk, it's this journey. Salik is the person who is traveling on this path. The purity of the clothing, which is a cover, it must in reality cover the clothes and cover and clothe my inner self as it was mentioned, and that is my barzakhi existence. And that barzakhi body of mine is a cover of that nafs. Nafs is a cover of the heart. Heart is the cover of the ruh. Ruh is the cover of that secret, that sir, that is within me and every higher level covers the lower level. So I have to, when I stand in worship before Allah Jalla wa ala, uh, this salat, it cannot be formed without tahara. So taharat also of the entire entity and that entire existence. So every impurity, it has to be removed from the attire, from the inner self and beyond. So my clothing that I'm wearing, it has to be clean from every najasat, from every uh, impurity. And that what is being covered is my inner self that also shouldn't have any impurity. What are the impurities of my inner self? It's this riya, if it's this bokhl, greed and pride and all these negative traits that are there, they also have to be removed. So I have to cover myself, hide myself. That is just like I remove the indecency and impurity from my clothes, that impurity from that uh, soul also has to be removed. So najasats, sins, indecencies, disobediences, they are all hindrances to seeking the nearness of God. Just like if there is a najasat on my, clo on my clothing, on my attire, that would be a hindrance towards that prayer. That prayer will not be correct if there is a najasat on me. So if there is a najasat on my soul also, that would be a hindrance towards seeking the nearness of Allah. Now, when you look into the ayat of Quran, one of the ayat, it says that وَأَنذِرْ هُمْ يَوْمَ الْحَسْرَةِ إِذْ قُذِيَ الْأَمْرُ وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ وَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ أَنذِرْ هُمْ means you <coughs> warn them of that يَوْمَ الْحَسْرَةِ يَوْمَ الْحَسْرَةِ it's the day of regret. One of the names given to the day of judgment. Why day of regret? Then when I arrive on the day of judgment, then I would say that 
this life that was given to me, I wish I had made better use of that life. I wish I had performed better prayers in my life. I wish, I wish, I wish this hasrat, hasrat, and this regret that will remain. So that is uh, so when it comes to this purification and the observing the, the, the dress code or the attire in the prayers, we should, and all this is a lesson to myself first. I must uh, remind myself of that day of regret that what will happen then? What will happen there? Will I be able to present myself with these prayers? So with that mindset that I have dressed with purity, with the libas of taqwa, with the attire of god weariness, and I've washed myself with the waters of tawbah and repentance. So this, my outer clothing, I wash it with water, all that indecency and impurity is removed. My inner self and the cover that is on that inner soul of mine, that needs to be removed and washed with tawbah, repentance. And that is uh, by seeking Allah, ask him to forgive, asking him to forgive us. And if someone sincerely repents and asks Allah to forgive, he also forgives. He says, That someone who has repented from a sin, it is as if there is no sin on him, no trace of wrong on him. So before we, when we've dressed ourselves and now we want to come to the prayer mat, that mindset should be that God, with all this impurity and with all this wrong that I have, I've come to this prayer mat to get to you. And that is that runway to ascension to the Mi'raj of Allah. Ta now with this cover that I have, disallowing any access to shaitan, so that he has no access on me, in any part of me, in any phase of me, neither in my outer cover, nor my inner cover. So he is not there. And now when I stand there, the hadith says that Rahimallah imra'an alima min ayn wa fi ayn wa ila ayn. That is, may Allah have mercy on someone who knows, uh, who knows from where he is and where he is and where he is heading to. So with that mindset, I come and stand uh, uh, purified before Allah. Now, with this cover and this attire that I have presented myself, Hadith says, this the soul of a mu'min, لَأَشَدُّ إِتْتِسَالًا بِرُوحِ اللَّهِ مِنْ إِتْتِسَالِ الشُّعَاءِ الشَّمْسِ بِهَا That this soul of a mu'min, is such desirous to connect to the mercy of Allah much more than the connection of a ray of a sun to the sun. That ray of the sun that you see, it's connected to the sun. There is no other way. It has to be connected and without the sun, it doesn't exist. Says the soul of a mu'min also is much more severe than the connection of that ray of the sun to the sun. Now we've seen many people when it is time for salah, just the Azan is heard when they are on the prayer mat. You see that the color tone changes. They change. That love they have, that joy they have, the enthusiasm they have towards standing before Allah Taala in salat and in worship. Now, with this dress code that I have stood before the Almighty, says it isn't as such that Allah is looking at my clothes. What I'm wearing, is it matching? Is it... Uh, and not, and what make it is, what brand it is, says no. In Allah, 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 He does not look at your faces. He looks at your heart. It's that heart that is accepted by Allah. That even in that uh, poem that we have, and generally it's written on the graves of Mu'mineen, says, uh, وَفَتُّ عَلَى الْكَرِيمِ بِغَيْرِ زَادٍ مِنَ الْحَسَنَاتِ وَقَلْبِ السَّلِيمِ Says, uh, now it's from Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, that I say I've embarked on a journey to Allah without any, without any uh, possessions. بِغَيْرِ زَادٍ What are the possessions that I need to have? 
It's the two pieces of luggage, min al-hasanat wa qalbis salimi. So I need to have good deeds. I need to have a sincere heart. Both of them I don't. Wa hamlu zad aqbahu kulli shay'in idha kana al-wafudu ala al-karimi. And that is the toughest task that I'm embarking on a journey to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. These two pieces of luggage are required, a sincere heart and hasanat, and both of them they are lacking. And Allah also in prayers, he doesn't look at what I'm wearing, my dress code, he looks at my heart. How this heart is covered, covered from every indecency, covered from every wrong, just like I cover my material body with every, uh, from every indecency, from every impurity. That was a little bit about the libas or the uh, attire that a person has to have and what mindset he should be having. Now, when you look into all of these worships that we have, may, they, may it be the salats or every component of that salat or even wuzu and every part of the wuzu, washing your face, it was mentioned last week, then washing your right hand, washing your left hand. There is a spiritual uh, can link to it which connects us to beyond it's not only the, uh, the 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 face that I'm washing and my hand that I'm washing there is an intense connection of washing away all the wrong that was done from the face all the wrong that was done by the hand all the wrong that is done by my other hand and then when I wipe my head head also it's being sheltered and showered under the mercy of the merciful God. So that was the wuzu. Now the, the dress, the, the cover and the clothing part is also the same. So everything, there is a spiritual blowing to it that we have to work on. Now ruku. Now inshallah, I'll talk a little bit about the other parts between the, uh, between the dress code and ruku next week. But now just for a change, we'll go to ruku first. Ruku, uh, when we see, it is that bowing down before Allah, the Baraka wa Ta'ala. Now, Ruku means I have bowed down before someone who is all great. So many times I've said Allahu Akbar and then I've embarked on this journey. So I admit his greatness. I'm trying to understand his greatness. And I admit how feeble, how weak, how small, how little I am. Now this, now this minuteness of mine, la amlikul nafsi nafan, that I don't have any benefit, wala dharran, I don't even have any loss, la mautan, no death, la hayatan, wala nushura. Life is also I don't have. Resurrection also, I don't have, nothing I have, nothing I have. Allah. And then without you, O oh God, I am nothing. And if we want to grow, we have to worship you. And every unit of this rak'at, it is called rak'at because of that ruku that is in there. Because of ruku, it is called rak'at. And every prayer is either two rak'at, having two ruku, Three rakat, having three ruku, etc. Now, now the adab is that when you bow down in ruku before the existence of God, you bow down halfway, that is ruku. You bow down completely, that is sajda. Now, someone who is offering his prayers in the sitting posture, then how much does he bow down in ruku? Says that as much as he can bend his back. And the best is that he brings his face until between his knees. All that much of a bending he should do when he's performing the prayers in the sitting posture. Now the duration in Ruku also, the minimum duration, it's either the amount of time one takes to say Subhana Rabbi al Alimi wa Bihamdeh or three times he says, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. That is that minimum duration of stay in Ruku. Now here some of the ulama are of the, are of the opinion that that much of a time that is spent in Ruku, for example, five seconds, six seconds. 
So six seconds it takes for you to take one Subhana Rabbi al Azimi wa bihamdi or three times Subhanallah. Some say that any zikr also you can say. The best of zikr, it's this Subhana Rabbi al Azimi wa bihamdi. Now, lessening or shortening that stay, less than those five seconds, which is the minimum stay that will make that faulty. So that much of a duration is required when we bow down in Ruku. Now, that what is wajib in Ruku is that the body has to be stable. Then you say, Subhana Rabbi al Azimi wa bihamdi. So you were standing, you bow down in Ruku. Now you say, Subhana Rabbi al Azimi wa bihamdi. Once you are done, then you rise. If someone starts saying Subhana, Subhana Rabbi al Azimi wa bihamdi and he hasn't reached his ruku and he was in motion, he was in a movement, that will make it faulty. Ruku has to be performed correctly and that much of an tuma'nina should be there. The body has to be relaxed when he starts saying the zikr of the ruku. Now, Someone who performs his ruku in a rush, quickly bending down in ruku and then rising and then jumping into sajda, says that will make that uh, that ruku batil. And if that ruku is batil, the entire salat will be batil, because ruku is among the arkan. Arkanu salat. There are five five main essentials of the salat. The first one is the niyat, takbiratul ihram and then ruku, and then sajda, and then the qiyam. So these are the five essentials or the elements or the rukn of prayers. One of them is ruku. So if ruku wasn't performed correctly, ruku will be batil, salat will be batil. If someone forgetfully adds on to the ruku or forgets the ruku in total, that salat will be batil. So ruku, we have to give importance to it. Now, just like when you're making a house, it's to, to have that house, you need some basics, and that is the pillars, the roof, the walls, that is that house will be there. But then we want to make that house, the inter interior decor, and then make it beautiful. Just like that, this Salat, Ruku is the Rukun of that prayer. You bow down for a few seconds, you've done the Ruku, but now you want to make it beautiful. That tazyeen and beautifying of that salat, it's with the beautifying of every part of that salat that you bow down in ruku. You've relaxed, you say, Subhan Rabbi al Azimi wa bihamdi. And then you stand. May want to make it even more beautiful? Repeat that a few times. Subhanallah, just not three times, seven times, ten times, however many times you can. Just like the interior decoration of your house here also this ruku also has to be done in that beautiful way and then when you've done your ruku you stand and you say Allahu liman hamida, Allahu akbar and then you go you slowly bow down into sajda now mustahab for men when they are performing ruku that they have their fingers apart when they kneel and their hands are on the knee for women, it is mustahab that they place their hands above the knee, and then that is the mustahab part for the women. Now, where do you look when you are in ruku? Between your knees, for both men and women, or between your two feet, you look there. Now, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he used to bow down in in ruku, his back was at a right angle, such that if water or oil was spilt on his back, it wouldn't drop of flow anywhere. There wasn't any slope as such. Now when we look into Quran, so much of emphasis is there to this ruku says wa salat wa zakat ma That is you establish prayers, you keep up prayers, wa zakat and then and then you give the zakat warkau and you perform ruku ma with those who perform ruku. Ruku is important. Even the Jews, they had uh, the ruku in their, in their deen. They had congregation and jamaat in their deen, but they misused it. They used to tamper with the ruku, so on and so forth. But then even then they had. So ruku, 
bowing down before Allah, it is only and only before Allah. We cannot bow down before anyone else. Now, when you see Surah Maryam, Surah Al Imran, regarding Hazrat Maryam, alayha salam, the Almighty he addresses and says, Ya Maryam, uknuti bi rabbiki wasjudi warkai ma arrakain. That is, Maryam, you be among those who are humble before your Lord, wasjudi, and perform sajda, warkai, and you bow down in ruku ma'arraki'in with those who perform that ruku. So the, um, ruku is important. A Jew, he comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and he says, uh, O Prophet of God, every other Prophet that we know, they had a successor. Do you have a successor? Do you have a successor? He says yes. That very moment he comes to brings uh, says let's go to the masjid I'll show you who my successor is. That very moment he comes to the mosque and a needy he comes to the mosque as well and he was in need of sadaqah. He asked for help no one was uh, uh, present in the mosque helped. Amirul Mu'mineen stretches his hands towards that person in need and he took his ring out there Jibreel descends and reveals that ayah in Nama Wali Yukumullahu wa Rasulu Waladina Amanu Aladina Yukimuna Salata wa Yutuna Zakata Wahum Rakyaun. Your guardian is only Allah. And then your guardian is only Allah. And then his Rasul Waladina Amanu. And then uh, among what are the other qualities they have? They keep up prayers, they give zakat, whilst they are in the state of ruku, they give zakat. So that is among the qualities and the attributes that were mentioned for Amirul Mu'mineen, and that was in the state of ruku. Furthermore, in Surah Tawbah, says when Allah, he wants to talk about the believers, who are they? Says at taibun they are those who are uh, ta'ib, who repent, al-abidun, those who worship, al-hamidun, those who celebrate, those who praise, as-sa'ihun, that is, they are those who, uh, those who fast, and those who, the, the wayfarers, ar those who perform ruku, as those who perform sajdas, and all the other qualities that have been mentioned, wa bashir al mu'mineen and give that good news to the mu'mineen. So among the qualities that Allah mentions for the mu'mineen is that they are in the state of ruku. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanur ka'u wasjudu wa'abudu. Another ayah in Quran from Surah Al-Hajj says that, O you who believe, perform sajdas, perform rukus, wa'budu rabbakum, you worship your Lord, wa'falul khair, you do good, la'allakum tuflihun, maybe you are fallacious. So all these beautiful ayat, among them the qualities of mu'mineen mentioned is that they perform ruku. Another ayah in Surah Fath, there when Allah mentions the qualities of the Followers and the companions of Rasulullah says Muhammadun Rasulullah. Walladina ma'ahu, those who are with him. Ashiddahu ala al-kuffar, they are tough on the kuffar, merciful within themselves. Tarahum, you would find them. Rukkaan, they are in the state of ruku. Sujjadan, in the state of sajda. Yabtaguna fadlan min Allah wa ridwana. What do they want with this ruku and sajda? They want the pleasure and the contentment of the Almighty Allah from this ruku and by this sajda. So that is that beautiful uh, worship that we have, and that is uh, the prayers, and then again um, in, in, the, in ruku and in sajda. Now, when we look into du'as also, among the beautiful phrases that we have in du'a, says, Ilahi aziqni halawata ibadatik that Allah, that taste and joy of your worship, let me taste it. 
azikni. Uh, let me taste it. Allow me to taste the beauty of worship. Now, beauty of worship, we haven't tasted. Now, those who have tasted the, the joy and the beauty of worship, for them, it's amazing. It's allowed for them, it's love. For many, it may be a burden. We are performing a duty and we are done with it. But those who are uh, in love with this Salat, with this beautiful gem, they enjoy that Salat. For them, it doesn't matter how long it takes. They don't just uh, perform prayers in just a few minutes. One, one of these books that we have, it's Nami as B. Nisham Ha. And uh, it's the biography of Marhum Ayatullah Sheikh Hassan Ali Nukhudaki Isfahani. Now this great mystic, now his grave is in the in the in Mashhad uh, in uh, in front of the Saqqa Khunin by the in front of the golden arch of the Haram of Imam Rida alayhi salatu was salam. And this Muqaddas man, this noble person, he used to occupy himself in worship. So every Thursday he used to come to the rooftop by the by the dome of Imam Rida alayhi salam and he used to occupy in worship. Sometime long surahs, lengthy rukus, lengthy sajdas and he used to occupy. Now the caretaker of the haram also he used to allow him and he was a noble person. And in those days the sacred shrine it, they used to close at midnight and open again an hour before Fajr. This is about 70 years ago. Then he says that on that Thursday night, this great alim, he says, uh, he comes there to offer his, uh, occupying himself in worship. And when, when it was nearer the midnight, I had to go and lock the haram. I couldn't leave the haram open. I went to check on Sheikh and tell him to, that I'm leaving for him also to come with me. I go there and I see that he is in Ruku. I wait for a bit. I go up and then check again, he is in Ruku. He had to, the caretaker had to rush home there. There was some urgent need. So he says that I went again, I saw he is in Ruku. Just to be on the safe side, it was winter. He leaves some firewood besides Sheikh if he is cold for him to heat himself. He says, I rushed out of the haram, locked the haram, and then early morning I was restless that somehow get to the haram and says that night it snowed heavily and I came to the haram, rushed to the rooftop and I see that this sheikh he is still in ruku. I thought he has passed away because there is a span of snow sitting on his back. When I come close I see that he is in ruku saying subhan rabbi al azimi wa bihamdih. That is that love, that joy they get in prayers. Dua is ilahi aziqni halawatazik ibadatik. Allah, taste me that sweetness of your worship. Now, on the contrary, we do have people when it is said to them to perform ruku la yarkaun wa idha qil lahum irkaun la yarkaun that perform ruku, they don't perform ruku. And that is وَيْلٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ And there are those uh, who are the deniers of the Day of Judgment. Now when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the early days of Islam, when the Muslims, they had so many sanctions from every side, now they were in need, especially in that Shaykh Abi Talib, they were in need. A delegation comes from Ta'if. Ta'if was a superpower at that time. They come to Rasulullah and they say that we will help you, we will support you, we will defend you, we will provide all food and military and artillery, whatever you want, we will be at your service, at your disposal. This one condition we have, says Rasulullah, and what is that condition? Now Muslims, when they heard this proposal from Ta'if, they were extremely happy that there is someone who's helping us in this difficult time. And then they say, uh, what is that condition? Rasulullah says, 
the condition is that you don't invite us towards ruku, towards prayers, towards bowing down before God. So the Muslims who were there, they thought that Rasulullah may accept this offer. Uh, then we see that Rasulullah had lowered his head for a while and then he raises his head and says to them, La khayra fi deenin laysa fihi ruku'un wa la sujood. That is a deen, a religion wherein there is no ruku and there is no sujood. This deen is of no use. He denies the, that proposal, that request for help. Now, when we see the seerah of Rasulullah after the victory of Mecca, the Prophet asks Hind. Hind is the mother of Muawiyah. Hind, Akilat al Akbad, that is mentioned in Ziyarat Ashura, or Hind Jigar Khar. Now, Rasulullah asks Hind, How did you find Islam? Hind in reply says, Islam is good with the exception of three things. Says, one, it is this hijab that I don't like in Islam. And then the azan, which is recited by Bilal, that I don't like. And the third thing that I don't like in Islam, it's this ruku and this sajda. Rasulullah in reply says to her, hijab, it's the best cover. Ruku and sujood, uh, without, with ruku and sujood, uh, without them, there is no salat. There is no namaz. And Bilal, he is the best of the servants of God. Now, when we offer this ruku, one who performs the ruku and perfects that ruku and complete the horror of the grave will, be, will not come towards him. Say so someone who does not offer his ruku correctly, that fishar qabr or the pressure in the grave that will be given to him. Imam al-Baqir says, someone who does his ruku correctly and perfectly, that horror in the grave is not for him. Now when we see du'as, uh, we, one of the du'as that is the ta'qibat that we recite after the prayers. Now we say to Allah that I've done this prayer, I've offered this service, O God. Ilahi in kana fiha khalalun. God, if there was any flaw in it. Naqsun, a mistake in it. Something I missed out. Min ruku aha from its ruku or sujood, fala to akhizni. God, don't punish me if there are any flaws in my prayers. And then I say, What tafadhal alayya bil kabul wal ghufran bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. And God, you accept it by your grace, by your forgiveness, you accept them by your mercy or merciful of the merciful. Now, Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam, he says that wafir ruku adabun wafir sujood qurbun. Says when you bow down in ruku before Allah, that is the discipline how a person, a servant, he has approached and he has stood before his master, his Lord. What does he want to say? That ruku portrays the servitude of God, that I am your servant. My existence is from you. I don't have anything of my own. So my existence is from you. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salam, when he stood in ruku, his ruku was such long that his feet, they sweated in his ruku and the place where he stood was wet and damp as a result of that sweat dripping from his feet. He stood for long. And that is that love that he has towards Allah wa ta'ala that Amir al muminin stands and performs such long rukus and worship. Just like that, Hazrat Zahra Salamullah alayha, Imam Mujtaba alayhi salam, he says, my mother, when she stood in worship, her feet, her legs, they swell. And now she would stand in worship all night praying for others. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he repeated the zikr of ruku 30 times. Subhan rabbi al-azimi wa bihamdih. Subhan rabbi al-azimi wa bihamdih 30 times. Now when we uh, offer prayers in masajid and a prayer takes a little longer, they say we don't want to come to this mosque anymore. This imam, this maulana, he takes, he offers prayers very long, takes, recites three times. Subhan rabbi al-azimi wa bihamdih or his ruku, it's so long. It's, it... 
Yeah. So that is uh, out of love that Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salatu was salam, he used to uh, offer his prayers and uh, have these uh, sajdas, lengthy the zikr of that sajda. In one of these sessions that I had in one of these mosques, uh, it was Laylatul Qadr and uh, it was hot. I had taken my amama off and the mic was with me and uh, the person, he couldn't see me sitting in that majlis. And then uh, he had a, uh, um, he spoke loud. He says, oh, oh, this is Maulana is here now. He'll send us to Sajda and like a tumble dryer, left and right and left and right. And who's going to bring us out of that Sajda? So people sometimes they get offended if that sajda it's a little bit longer than usual, but that is out of love that a person has to have when it comes to performing sajdas and rukus, and that is due to love that they have. When we see uh, the Nahjul Balagha of Amirul Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salam, he says that min malaikatihi min hum sujudun la yarka'un. Some of the angels of Allah, they are always in sajda, never in ruku. Some of the angels, they are always in ruku, never in sajda. So when someone offers a longer ruku or is in the state of sajda, he is resembling those angels of Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala. Now there are three things, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says that there are three things that a mu'min, if he knew, it will increase his life. And then the blessings that Allah has given to him, they will be permanent on him, they will continue. Now the reporter, he says that, what are they? Ya ibn Rasulullah, what are they? Imam says, lengthening his ruku and sujood in his prayers. And then lengthening your sitting on the table when you are eating. That is when you're having a meal, sit on the table for long, don't rush. Here says this hadith that someone who sits on the table for long, that is not going to be counted as part of his life. That is, there is no account to be given. Doesn't mean that you sit and eat and eat and eat. No, sit on the table, take your time, have your meal. Not like what's happening nowadays, just in a rush. In a few minutes, you have to eat and go on the go, on the rush. Says so you sit on the table for long, that sitting of yours will be worship. It will not be counted as part of your life. And the third thing is serving the family, helping them um, in, in all their needs and requirements. So the first thing is that, that that is lengthening his ruku and his sajda. If you do that, Allah will give his blessings upon you and those blessings, they will continue. And it is something that you will not regret on the day of judgment. So when in Surah Al-Waqiyah, فَسَبِّحْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَظِيمِ When this ayah was revealed, Rasulullah says, اِجْعَلُوهَا فِي رُكُوعِكُمْ You place this ayah in your ruku, say, سُبْحَانَ رَبِّيَ الْعَظِيمِ وَبِحَمْدِهِ And when Surah Al-A'la was revealed, سَبِّحْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَلَى Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he says, place that in your sajda. Say, سُبْحَانَ رَبِّيَ الْعَلَى وَبِحَمْدِهِ Imam Baqir alayhi salam, he says that teach and train your children for ruku and sajda from the age of five and six and teach them the azkar and actions and the afal of the prayers from the age of three to seven. They should, be, they should have learned how to offer the salat. Now, beautiful riwayat we have. That is, إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَن تَرْكَعْ وَتَسْجُدْ فَرْفَعْ يَدَيْكَ وَكَبِّرْ ثُمَّ رْكَعْ وَسْجُدْ That is, when you intend to bow down in ruku, that is, and then when you want to bow down in sajda, فَرْفَعْ يَدَيْكَ You raise your hands, you say, Allahu Akbar, and then you go to ruku. So you are in sajda, you come out, and then you say, sit up and say, Allahu Akbar, raise your hands. Want to go to sajda again? Then you say Allahu Akbar and then you go down into sajda. That is that that, we, uh, that has to be said. And that is that height of adab uh, that is observed. Imam Askari alayhi salam, he says that um, the Almighty, he addresses the angels and says, Ya malaikati, ama tarawnahu kayfa tawada'a li jalali adamati? 
do you not see my servant how he has how he has uh, yeah how he has uh, submitted to me how he has respected be uh, before me humbled before me and before my honor before my greatness says for this beauty of his that he has humbled himself before my greatness i will exalt him in my house of honor so someone who bows down in ruku before the greatness of allah tabarak wa taala allah says i will exalt him in my house of honor so how will i honor him says la az la uazzimannahu fi dar al kibri fi dar kibriyai wa jalali says i will may exalt him in my house of honor in my greatness and salat makes man divine he creates another world beyond this world for himself for every tasbih that you say in your ruku you say subhanallah once allah makes a house for you the hadith says that a, a, a brick is laid for you uh, for your palaces for your dwellings that are made in the heaven another hadith says that the moment you say subhanallah a tree is planted for you in the heaven so all these beautiful teachings we have that this ruku has to be performed has to be done in that beautiful way and that is that height of adab and that discipline before allah tbarak wa taala when you bow down before him and sajda it's that qurb that is seeking the nearness of allah so getting to that sajda it's that height of prayer and then slowly you embark on this journey you bow down into ruku and then you rise and then you go to sajda so this salat it's that beautiful gem that allah tbarak wa taala has made has created has obligated mankind and that is for his own benefit to get closer to allah tbarak wa taala may allah jalla wa ala count us all among the musallin those who keep up prayers those who establish prayers that love for prayers be given to every one of us aziqni halawata ibadatik and that aziqni halawata dhikrik just as the sweetness of your remembrance of your worship all of that be given to every one of us and make it as such that before it's too late we recognize we know what this prayer is how the salat has to be offered before that prayer is offered upon us wa subhana rabbika rabbil izati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al mursalin walhamdulillah rabbil alamin it is the night of tauba night of mercy night of imam al asr alayhi salatu was salam we ask allah that by the mediation of imam al asr ajjal allah taala farajahu al sharif give us tawfiq that better services and worship we be able to offer those who are ill and ailing allah grant them shifa and a complete cure those who have passed away allah forgive them elevate their ranks islam and muslimin to be given with honor izzat height and might and those who have stood against islam allah remove them from the surface of this dunya mm -hmm. وعجل في فرج مولانا صاحب الزمان اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرج thank you molana for such an amazing lecture um mominin this is the time you're going to start the q and a uh for today uh we have we have three questions already ready for you molana so the first question is uh what is the significance of reading namaz on time oh what's the question what is the significance of reading namaz on time or the significance of namaz on time yeah well salat has to be offered on time i'll give i'll, I'll recite you uh, a hadith and this is from imam al asr alayhi salatu was salam imam says oh, that uh, uh mal'oon 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 means someone who is cursed and distanced from the special mercy of allah jalla wa ala now who is that mal'oon says someone who delays his fajr prayers now in the, in the morning when you want to say your fajr prayers you can see the stars 
And when the sun starts rising, you see that these stars, they disperse. You don't see the stars anymore. Likewise, when it is time for Maghrib, you don't see the stars. When it's Awwal Maghrib. Then, when after a few minutes, maybe 15, 20 minutes, you see the stars, they start to emerge. You see the stars in the sky. Imam al-Asr alayhi salam, he says that mal'oonun mal'oon, that is, distance from the special mercy of Allah is someone who delays his Fajr prayers until the stars, they vanish. That's just 15, 20 minutes. And mal'oonun mal'oon, someone who de delays his Maghrib prayers until the stars, they are evident, that also doesn't take more than 15, 20 minutes. So from that special mercy of Allah, a person is distanced. And likewise for the Zohar prayers, say Zohar prayers, it's that pivot and the backbone of your life. So you need to offer your prayers dot on time. And when you look into the statements of these mystics, for example, Marhum Ayatullah Qazi Tabatabai, he is the Ustad of all of these present orafa, Marhum Ayatullah Bahjad, Marhum Allah Tabatabai, all these great personalities who have passed away, he says that his Ustad has said that someone who does not, someone who offers his prayers dot on time, at the time of Fazila, and he does not get to those high ranks, uh, spit on my face or curse me. Says it's impossible for you to arrive at those ranks, to not arrive at those ranks by offering your prayers on time. On time prayers are very important. No, now, this question also may come to your mind that uh, on time prayers we need to offer then, uh, how is it possible that um, that tawajjo, all these things that we were talking about in this salat, uh, how can all that be observed? It's not possible. Ayatollah Bahajan, he says that even that prayer that you offer, just say that on time without, uh, even if you don't have that connection that you need to have, that also slowly it will be given to you. But regardless of that tawajjo, that connection, that presence of your mood and manner and your mind, just do it on time that on-time prayer has that immense, beautiful barakah. In addition to every other barakah that you see in your life, it is because of that on-time salat. It is important now when you look back into the seerah of uh, the ulama, uh, Imam Khomeini, rahmatullahi alayhi, when he was in Paris, and then the, it was prior, but a few days before the Islamic revolution, says that there were about 300 news reporters who had come to uh, for an interview from him and it, it got delayed, whatever that reason was. And then when it was about to start, uh, it was time for Zohar. He asked his son, said Ahmad, that it is Zohar. He says, yes, just now it's Zohar. He just leaves that uh, meeting and he goes to offer his praise. They say that there are so many news reporters here waiting, says, but the time of Fadila, if it's gone, it will not return. So time of Fadila, it is very important. Now, the other thing that we have in this time of Fadila and offering prayers on time, and that is, yeah, on time prayers is that uh, when, Allah, when you are saying your prayers on time, uh, Imam al Asr alayhi salatu was salam, he is the pivot and the center and the core of existence. He says his prayers on time. So when you say your prayers at that time of Fadila, you've got the Imam also saying his prayers at that time of Fadila. So Imam is offering his prayers from this dunya as a result of his namaz, his salat, which is a complete salat, which is a perfect salat. As a result of that salat, there is this connection between this dunya and beyond. As a result of which there is this immense downpour of barakat and special favors of Allah. So that connection is there. The downpour of barakat and rahmah is there. And when you offer your prayers at that time when there is this heavy, uh, immense downpour and download of barakat, your prayers also will be blindly accepted at that time. Because of that connection that has been created by the salat of the imam. But now if you say your prayers late after the Imam has said his prayers, 
Now you don't have that connection, that uh, strong connection. You have to do something and get your prayers uploaded uh, with your connection. So that is impossible. That how can we have those prayers that are so weak and faulty, get them uploaded and then to the existence of God. But with the prayers of Imam, it just ascends and it is accepted. That's the other beauty that of you know, pray, offering prayers on time. Beautiful, beautiful. May, all, may we all increase our willpower and have the ability to pray on time. Inshallah. Inshallah. So for the next question, uh, the question is, why does the Imam that uh, is performing Juma sits down for a little while after the first khutbah? Uh, that I exactly don't remember, but when we see the seerah of Rasulullah and Amirul Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salatu wasalam, they used to do that. Now that's what we do have in uh, riwayat. It says that the two khutbas, they complement the two rak'at of prayers that we are not offering because Juma Salat is just two rak'at. And then we have two khutbas which are offered, which are recited before the uh, before the two, uh, before the Juma prayers, so those two khutbas uh, are instead of the two rakat that will be not offered from the Juma prayers. Uh, so Zohar is four, but then we offer two. But then we have two khutbas also. These two khutbas are in the place of two rakats that are from that namaz, and that's why the ruling of all of the ulama is that. If you participate in the Juma, it is wajib on you that you listen to the khutbah, even if you don't understand the language or whatever that khatib and the speaker is saying in that uh, Juma, but still you have to listen to it. It's wajib on you. And if someone sits there, offers and occupies himself in worship or in something else, he has committed a sin. So sometimes people, they think that now that I don't understand this khutbah, I'll do some nawafil, I'll do some uh, azkar and recite something. So all that is a sin that is being done because he is, he has to listen to that khutbah even if he doesn't understand. Thank you for the answer, Mulana. On to our next question, which is also a question that I was curious about, that I was going to ask today. So the Ahl Bayt, did they pray the namazes like Zuhrain and Maghribain, did they do it as together as one or did they do each namaz separately depending on the time? Yeah, first of all, to you, uh, all of you in your age group, the first reply would be uh, to not get your deen from Google and from, <laughs> <laughs> and from TikTok. This is a lot of Islam, this Wahhabi brand of Islam has created such a lot of nuisance, such a lot of confusion and doubts that every day I have got these questions coming up. And when I go a little bit into detail, I know where it's coming from. So that is what Ahlul Bayt, what did they do? Did they offer prayers together or did they uh, offer them in five spots? Now, both of these options have been given by the Ahlul Bayt. Rasulullah, at times he used to join the prayers Zohar and Asr at times, Maghrib and Isha, they were, uh, they were offered uh, at five desi, at, at their own times of Fazila. Both of them were observed. So both of the options have been given to us by the Ahlul Bayt. The easier option is to join and say them. And then the difficult option is to say, offer them. And it is mustahab also among the teachings and the uh, instructions that were given by Imam Khomeini to the youth he says, try to offer your prayers at five designated times at that time of fazila. So that's the difficult option. Now, when you look into your own busy lifestyle in your schools, at your work, uh, is it possible for you to get those uh, four slots from your employer if you are in the afternoon shift? You want to have four breaks to say your prayers? Sometimes they're going to be difficult. But if you say that I want two slots, one at 12.30 and one at 5.30. You think they will give you, but four slots we want. The same thing is with your schools. You can say your prayers together. That's the easier option that has been given. Now, even the Ahlul Sunnah, they've got this option, but they don't mention it. When they are traveling, they've got the option to say the prayers together. 
that you see those who offer their prayers and they are punctual. When they are traveling, they do the Zuhrain together. They do the Maghribain together. And when they travel for Hajj in, the, in Mina and in Arafat and in Muzdalifa, they join their prayers. They say Zuhr and Asr together. They say Maghrib and Isha also together. So both of these options, both of us have. We have taken the easier option and we perform the prayers together. They've taken the difficult option and they offer the prayers at five designated spots. It isn't as such that it was something that we, don't, we, are, we are going against the Prophet. Both of us are right. Both of us are correct. That, and both of these options were given by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. That's, that's great to know. Um, now I know it's mustahab, so I can try to apply myself to do it five separate times. Um, for our next question, uh, the next question is, what is the significance of holding the staff during the khutbah in Salat al-Jumma'ah? Yeah. One of the uh, reasons for that Salat al-Jumma'ah, it's that uh, we are prepared. We are ready to serve the noble cause of Islam. And it is one of those prayers where the <coughs> Imam invites people towards Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad yeah, Imam invites people towards joining and serving the Imam alayhi salatu was salam. Now the idea, because Salatul Jumu'ah, it's one of those designated tasks that are on the Imam, wajib on the Imam. And when the Imam returns, it will be wajib. Now it's not wajib. So Imam, uh, that is, uh, this prayer belongs to him. And he will appoint who will be leading which prayer and who will be the Jummah leader, just like what is happening in Iran now. And it's going to be the rule of the Imam. So that Salat al, Salat al Jummah and Salat al Eid also belong to the Imam. So it's in a way that we are all preparing ourselves to join, to support the Imam, and that is in the service of Islam and the Muslimin. So that also, when you want to, you're holding that gun or that staff or that stick. That is, you are ready, you are well equipped, and you are armed to be in his service. When you look into the dua ahad also, it's the same thing. That is, you, your dua early in the morning after your fajr prayers is that, Allahumma in hala bayni wa baynahu al-mawt. That is, Allah, if death intervenes between me and him, fa'akhrijni min qabri, that Allah bring me out of my grave. Shahiran Saifi. Shahiran Saifi means well equipped and that sword readily available with me. Why sword available? Because I want to serve the Imam, to join his army, to be with him. Thank you, Mulana, for that answer. Our next question for you is if someone cries during namaz in the fear of Allah, Will it cause the namaz to be void or annulled? Uh, no. Crying due to the fear of Allah in your worship, in your prayers, will not make it void. You are allowed to do that. And is it also, I've heard that if zat ashura is happening and your tears come down your face, that is also, it does not break your namaz as well? In your prayers? Yeah, if uh, if you hear Ziyat Ashura in the background happening and you start to cry when you hear it, would that break namaz? I've heard, I've heard several sides of it, so I was curious myself. Well, in your salat, you have to be focused to your God. You have to be focused. Now, on the day of Ashura, some, the day is so intense, the the day it's so painful that you are offering your prayers and then you break into tears, you cry. So that's fine. But yeah, it's the same answer. As long as you are connected to Allah, you are okay. Okay. And for our next question, um, the question is, can you pray Jummah prayers or Salat al-Jummah Behind the Imam, does the Imam need to be there or can you pray by yourself? You cannot. The Salat al-Jama'ah has to be offered in Jama'at. You cannot offer the 
Juma prayers in Farada. There is a minimum count depending on which mujtahid you follow. There has to be a minimum count of five or seven. Some maraja they say that it has to be five. Uh, including the imam, some say seven, including the imam. So if that count is there, only then will the Juma be established. If the count is less than five, Juma will not be established. Juma prayers, it is a jama'at prayers. Jumua, it's from that gathering. So, so it has to be in a congregation. You cannot offer them furada. Thank you for that answer, Mulana. For our next question, um, the question is, what is the significance of the practice of hijab for women on the, in the state of Salat? And what, ha what does it have to do with the acceptance of that prayer? Significance of hijab? Uh, well, of, the, of the gown? Yeah. Like, well, she has to be covered from head to toe. The only side, the part that can be uncovered is the face and her hands. Exactly the same attire that is observed when a, when a lady she is performing her tawaf. Uh, and she, in tawaf, it's the same thing that she can have. It is wajib for her to have her face uncovered. Um, and if she does cover her face in tawaf, then she has to give a kafara. In salat also, it's the same thing. The face can be left uncovered. The hands can be left open. Now, sometimes people, they do offer prayers with see-through head covers, that is batil, that namaz is going to be batil, with a see-through dupatta, with a see-through head cover, or with sleeves that have a, that are not until the uh, wrist, and if that part of the hand is being shown, that salat also will be batil. Now for the feet, if there is a non-mahram around, then feet also should be covered. If there are no, there is no non-mahram around, then that's fine. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Mulana, for that answer. Um, we'll be ending the we'll be ending the Q and A at nine twenty. So, any last minute questions, Momini? Please feel free to put them in the YouTube link in the comment sections below. Um, it looks like there was a clearing up of that question, so or needing of clarification. So, I think they were asking in general the practice of hijab in Islam and her acceptance of salah. I think they're asking for a little bit more clarification when it comes to it. Like the practice of hijab in life and does it do anything um, if they are not significantly practicing hijab in, in their day-to-day -day lives, does it do anything with the acceptance of their salat if they're going to the ibadat and doing it right? See, uh, it's two different things. We've got so many wajibat that we need to abide by. So in those wajibat, we've got salat, we've got zakat, we've got hajj and khums and everything. And there's, there's a whole package of wajibat that needs to be observed. There are many who do many things and some of the things they do not. And there are sins that many other times you and me also may be committing, which are not part of deen. So here we cannot say that such and such a person, her hijab uh, is an issue, so her salat will not be accepted. No, we can't say that. Salat is wajib. Fasting is wajib, hijab is wajib, homes is wajib. So whatever they are not doing, that's between them and their God. If they don't do any of it, then they will be questioned. If they are doing some of it, for that some that they are doing, they will not be questioned. So wajibat need to be done. We can't say, we are no one to say that. Uh, my prayers and my this is good, but then there will be so much of wrong that I'm doing. What about that wrong that I have in myself? So we have to mind our own business that what is not related to us is not related to us. If by uh, Amr bil Ma'roof you can correct and you can invite and you can convey them, do it. If you know that if you do that, it's not going to have any effect, it's going to have an adverse effect, then it's not wajib on you to tell them as well. Thank you so much, Mulana, for that answer. And I will say the last question um, for tonight. Uh, the last question for tonight is, since Rajab is coming up, what is the significance of the Amalat of Laylat al So the people may know and that they are prepared for when that night comes, what, what is its significance yeah. tonight and what they can do? The first night of the 
Laylatul of Rajab is known as Laylatul Raghayab. It's the night of hopes and the, it's the night when everyone has all these aims and ambitions and they can get to them. And it's a night of great honor and there are some prayers also for that uh, night. Well, basically it's not, it, um, it's just a uh, 12 rakat of prayers to be offered in that night. And it's beautiful, beautiful, doesn't take much of your time, maybe 30 minutes, maybe 25 minutes with some azgar to be recited after that. And it's a night where well, now both the schools of thought, they have mentioned this Laylatul Ravaib. It isn't as such that it is only us, even the others they have mentioned. So offer it now, especially in this pandemic. I don't know if you have it in your centers. Over here, it's not allowed. If you are allowed, you can do it. If you can't, then you do it at home. Anyway, it is a mustahab salat that you offer. Give importance to these little things because we don't know what is going to be accepted from us. Now, all these hot spots that Allah Jalla creates for us, we have to benefit from them, like Nimei Shaban, 15th of Shaban, this 27th of Rajab, Laylatul Ragaib. All these are important occasions. And this hadith also that we just recited today, that Allah says, uh, well, wajib you have to do. If you don't do, you'll be punished. But ma, these mustahabbat, these nawafil, and Allah did not obligate you to do them. But when you do those mustahabbat, he says you become the hearing ear of Allah. Your sight becomes the sight of, your eyes become the eyes with which Allah sees. So you become a, uh, a servant of God. And then he says, with all these mustahabbat and nawafil, and you have observed, when you raise your hands and when you ask for whatever you want, he says, I will give you. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Mulana, so much for that answer. And I have I have jotted down the questions that we did not get to tonight, and we will ask those questions next week in the next lecture series, um, in the fifth lecture. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending, and I'd like to thank our beloved scholar, Mulana Heather Shazi, for being with us and uh, giving us another amazing speech, another, another amazing Q&A. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Islamic Center Moment in our community for doing this for us and informing us and having this amazing lecture series with us. Thank you all. Thank you all. And iltimas to from every one of you. وَرَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيلْ عَلِيمَ اللَّهُمَّ اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِوَالِدَيْنَا وَلِمَنْ وَجَبَ لَهُ حَقٌّ عَلَيْنَا وَلِمَنْ وَسَّانَا بِالدُّعَى وَلِجَمِيعِ أُمَّةِ مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَالِ مُحَمَّدٍ For all المؤمنين and المؤمنات الفاتحة مع السلوات اللهم صل على محمد وعالي محمد Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Malana. Thank you.